Hello everyone, Dr. Stone here. And tonight we are gonna be talking about everything you need to know about nutrition in one lesson. So there's tons of nutritional content out there on the internet, YouTube, Rumble, various other sites. I have a problem with how most of it is being delivered or rather how it's being presented. Frequently it's being presented as a pitch for you to ultimately go buy somebody's supplement. Skipping ahead to the end of this video, I don't have a marketing shtick for you on supplements tonight. The vast, vast majority of my patients wind up off of supplements, though they use them for a discrete period of time. The caveat to that is that they will need more supplementation and um, uh, nutritional support therefrom if they continue to live super high stress lifestyles that consume nutrients at an above normal rate. But the thing I want you all to understand about nutrition and the way I approach it is as someone who's trying to get people onto the right diet for them, there's no need in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, barring some unusual genetic anomalies, for anyone to continue taking mega doses of, of nutrients every single day. We may one day substantiate that there's therapeutic value in that as a longevity or anti-aging measure. I totally understand that, but the reality that a lot of people in the supplementation and nutrition industry don't want to talk about is that despite many, many studies being done looking at, okay, if we give people B6 supplements or folate supplements or calcium supplements or this supplement or that supplement, will we actually get a prolongation of their life. I can tell you, having looked at individual patients' labs, your levels vary widely and from individual to individual, and small changes can make a big difference. Uh, and the, the goal of this is to really help you understand the principles by which I believe we should be pursuing nutritional supplementation and repletion based upon uh, some of the critical studies and, and, and ideas that have really at this point been really well established in clinical nutrition. This is also not going to be some long spiel on you know, uh, how good vitamin D is and how much of it you need and why you should take more of it. I find that there's a lot of nutrition, let's just call it influencers out there who will just drown you in information without really delivering you any meaningful lessons that help you organize your thinking so that you will make better decisions even in the absence of a doctor or, or communicate with a provider in a more intelligent way such as, you know, yes, doctor so-and-so, I think it's great that you want me to take vitamin C or this drug or whatever, but when can I get off of it and how can I correct the underlying imbalances that lead me to need it, right? Remember Hippocrates, the father of medicine said, the greatest medicine of all is teaching people how not to need it. If your doctor or your other healthcare provider doesn't have conversations with you about how to do exactly that, they either don't know or they've been disempowered to have those conversations with you by their employer. Here's looking at you, big healthcare, you are the scum of the earth. It's nothing personal, it's just the truth. First lesson, first thing you all need to know about nutrition in one lesson is triage theory. So what's triage theory? The way I explain this to, to patients, because the question always comes up, you know, why am I deficient in X or why do I need more of the X or Y, right? Well, I, I don't see any, you know, low level on my serum lab. So what do you mean I need more of it, right? So the analogy I'll use is with water, okay? Because water is ultimately a vital nutrient to, to you, but you really only need about two liters of water a day. And I mean that as two liters of water, period. If I were to give you two liters of water to do everything you want to do in your life, you might be able to make an eight ounce cup of coffee in the morning, and you might be able to have a couple of glasses of water over the course of the day. And maybe you would add some powdered you know, uh, fruit to make a, a, a fruit juice or something like that. And then you would have something, something to sweet, delicious to drink later in the day, but you would end up thirsty and you wouldn't be able to wash your hands, your body, your dishes, or flush the toilet, and you would get upset about that. Now, would there be any overt signs of disease from this? No. Long-term, might there be complications because of things like poor hygiene? Obviously. Water and all the other nutrients are the same in this regard. There is a, a clear amount that you need in order to just survive. There is a window then beyond that for what is optimal. This window depends upon your demand. And this is what triage theory is all about. Okay. There's also a, a point at the end with diminishing returns as in more does not equal better. It may even equal worse. So triage theory posits that some functions of micronutrients 
are restricted during shortage and that functions required for short-term survival take precedence over those that are less essential, which is just to say that the biochemical pathway is driven by and dependent upon these micronutrients. The ones that are not essential for survival will get shut down by the system in order to shunt the nutrients into the pathways that are critical. They've demonstrated this using a variety of different uh, study designs for vitamin K dependent proteins and enzyme systems uh, in different laboratory animals and demonstrating that there's changes in the rates of different um, diseases in those animals when those pathways are, uh, are deranged. And so the idea here that I really wanna start with is that you're looking for the optimal window uh, now, that optimal window, as I said before, is also determined by what is going on as far as demand, right? I might have two patients with the same labs coming in, but one of them is in a super high stress lifestyle. They may develop new nutritional deficiencies and they may need to eat more food and a greater density of micronutrients in order to maintain normal levels than the person over here who's living a less low or a, a lower stress life. Okay. Second lesson. Tachyphylaxis. So tachyphylaxis is a very well-described principle of pharmacology that for some reason gets literally ignored in the vast majority of therapeutic encounters with patients um, to the great detriment and disservice of, of everyone, but to the immense um, uh, profit of uh, private corporations and healthcare systems. What do I mean by that? Okay. So tachyphylaxis is the property of a system to try to overcome any external effect upon its internal functioning. When you, for example, give someone uh, a drug that modulates their neurotransmitters or their hormones, the body will respond by, and let's say that you increase the levels of neurotransmitters, say in the synapse, in the nerve uh, uh, synapse, the body will naturally downregulate the number of receptors, which means the effect of the drug will wear off. Uh, this is better known perhaps as tolerance. You need more and more of a given drug in order to have the same pharmacological effect. This is why many people, the, the, the therapeutic pattern is that they start on a drug for some disease and they start out needing a certain amount of it and then they need more of it and they need more of it and then they need even more of it. And then finally, they're at a dose of the medication where there is no further therapeutic effect and all you're getting into is toxic, um, toxic effects. And so you really have to stop the therapy or in as much as you're gonna keep the therapy, you can't increase and then you have to add another therapy. Okay, the better question we should be asking is what is creating the imbalance in the first place, right? I can give you an endless number of, of examples from, you know, general medicine, which is my you know, area of training. But the, the example I want to give you from this study uh, is on something called um, glucuronate and glucuronidation. So glucuronidation is this process by which the liver attaches uh, glucurate uh, molecules to um, <clears throat> do different toxins in order to make them more water soluble. When they're more water soluble, they tend to be excreted by the body rather than retained. When they're fat soluble, they tend to get swept up by the bowel acids and recirculated into the liver, which is bad. So we know from the literature that um, people who have and animals that have high levels of beta-glucuronidase in their microbiome or their peripheral tissues, what happens with beta-glucuronidase is that it, it causes the glucuronate molecules to be cleaved off of the toxin and then the toxin recirculates. In the supplement world, this means that calcium deglucurate supplements, such as is used in this study, uh, get marketed as detoxification aids. But there's a problem with this, and that's what this study is really all about. They took a bunch of rats, um, and they looked at what happens when you expose them to a known toxin. Uh, the known toxin was uh, diethyl nitrosamine, okay? And they looked at what happened to the rats' livers. They know that these chemicals and many chemicals will cause carcinogenesis, in other words, cancerous changes in the liver. Now, if you give them something that's going to cause them to detoxify more of it, that's great, right? Because what you'll be doing is you'll be excreting more of the toxin that will otherwise cause the liver. But what happens when you do this chronically? Okay. So initially, histopathologic evaluation of the liver sections showed that the G CGT has significantly delayed the development of altered hepatic foci. That's a fancy way of saying that using the calcium deglucurate decreased or rather delayed the development of these carcinogenic changes in the liver, cancer-related changes in the liver. But by the seventh month post-initiation, the frequency and severity of changes seen in the livers of experimental animals approximated those of controls. What does that mean? It means that 
regardless of what this, these rats were being given to delay this process, eventually the body itself said, no, 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 no. We need a certain amount of glucuronidation to go on. And we're going to change the rate at which we're doing it in order to compensate for this external um, factor. What this means is that in, in nutrition, frequently we have a therapeutic and, you know, in medicine, we have a therapeutic window and, and I, I like to call it a therapeutic runway. We've got a window in which the drug will work at the dose we're using or the, the, the nutritional, if we're talking about a nutrient, right? But then we've got a runway. We've got a certain period of time. We've got to use that in. And that's why I'm very clear with people. Look, I don't want you using these things forever. I can't tell you how many people have come to me over the years and they say, well, I've been taking this turmeric for the last eight years. Well, what is it doing for you? Does anything happen when you stop taking it? Well, actually, you know, no, nothing happens when I stop taking it. Can I stop taking it? Sometimes the answer is yes. The point is simply this. The body will try to adjust to what you're doing to stop it from having the effect. You've got to bring into balance underlying things, underlying variables and factors in order to get real lasting resolution of things and prevent illness. And this brings me to the next lesson, which is that repletion happens and is just as bad as deficiency and can actually create deficiencies. So this is a case report of a young man who took very large doses of zinc supplements for six to seven months for acne. The doses for zinc in this can be very high, 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams. And this ultimately resulted in a zinc-induced hypocupremia or a copper deficiency, which can be life-threatening. <clears throat> so I test zinc and copper levels in pretty much every patient that I see, and I have been amazed by the imbalances that we'll see in these levels uh, based upon these labs, uh, and then to get from their dietary history, understand why these patterns have emerged, foods they don't eat, foods they eat a lot of, um, uh, ways that they may prepare it, that may alter the absorption and assimilation, uh, environmental or uh, lifestyle stressors that may create an uh, unusual uh, throughput or, or burn rate, let's call it, for a nutrient. But my point is this, you can replete your body with practically any micronutrient in a matter of months. The only reason people don't make it happen is there's something creating a problem that prevents them from taking up uh, or retaining it in the body. And that's there's a lot of different things that, that go into that, but people taking just one day after another, one year, one month, um, it's a little bit like imagining, you know, you put your, your fingers on the wheel of your car and it, it changes the direction of your, of your vehicle just imperceptibly. But you all know that if you do that on the highway at 80 miles an hour, you will drive off of the road in a matter of seconds to minutes. So we have to be careful when we do this not saying that some people don't benefit from long-term supplementation, but doing it without understanding what the side effects are of long-term supplementation at the dose that you're using, dose is very important here, right, is a big mistake. So the other thing in the next lesson is that repletion in the wrong order is actually worse than deficiency. And this gets into the idea that these nutrients all interact with one another and are all related to their metabolism Okay, so role of magnesium and potassium in the pathogenesis of arteriosclerosis. Okay, so magnesium deficiency results in vascular calcification. Many people will be told you need to take a calcium supplement because you have osteoporosis. Okay, well, magnesium is necessary for normal architecture of the bony matrix. It is an incredibly common problem. And the way that people are assaying or testing for it is very... Uh, simplistic, and I think prone to error, and does not adequately reflect total body magnesium stores, okay? When you try to give somebody calcium in the absence of adequate magnesium, what this study is, is showing you and, or stating, and I think this agrees with an abundance of literature on this topic, is that, magnesi is that the, the calcium may wind up going into the vasculature, which is to say causing cardiovascular disease, and that's bad. This paper also opines on potassium, but let me save you the trouble of, uh, of guessing, okay? Potassium has the same effects on calcium handling, and it also affects magnesium handling. All these things are connected, okay? And so looking at these things, oh, I'm, I have osteoporosis, therefore I have low calcium. Well, hold on a minute. 
what other things are necessary for you to put the calcium into the proper place? It would be like saying, well, my house is, you know, is in disrepair. I don't have enough nails. Well, what if you bought all of the nails you could possibly want from Home Depot, but they're on back order uh, and they can't get to you because you don't have a truck to ferry them to your house? What happens when the body starts to run out of magnesium is the blood levels drop. Now, what will happen then is the serum or the, the, the bone will start to resorb. And this happens with many different minerals, by the way, particularly calcium as well. And as that bone resorbs, the magnesium helps to increase the extracellular fluid and, and serum levels. Okay. This is really important because what this means is that if you've got normal magnesium in your serum, it doesn't mean you have optimal levels of magnesium in your bone, let alone your organs, tissues, brain, et cetera, et cetera, where magnesium is very important and may be depleted at a very rapid rate. So what does this mean? It means that the typical contemporary way that doctors test for nutritional deficiencies is they take a simple blood sample and they say, what's the level of the nutrient in the blood? And what I explain to patients is this is a little bit like asking, you know, what your you know, 401k balance is or how much money you've got saved up to retires or what your net worth is based upon what's in your checking account, right? So even somebody with billions of dollars could have a checking account balance of two or 300 because they didn't pay attention to how much was in the bank and you know, got a little bit overdrawn. That would be an example of somebody who's got really good overall health, wonderful uh, um, uh, mineral stores, but they get into a really unfortunate um, accident or they have an acute illness that's brought on by a you know, tragic you know, exposure to an environmental toxin or an infection or whatever, and they end up with a, a, a mineral, let's say magnesium deficiency uh, because of the acute stress and the bone can't resorb fast enough to buffer the loss from the blood. Okay, that's very different from somebody who's got a low level of magnesium, who's chronically ill, has got very poor overall health, has got very low bone density, uh, and likely has overall uh, body uh, low magnesium compared to their, um, compared to that person who's healthy and compared to what they need in order to be their optimal, at their optimal level of functioning. So you've got a total body amount, and then you've got what's in the serum. These are not the same thing. So drawing and extrapolating from the serum levels to the total body level is fraught with, with errors. There's different ways to get around this. We'll talk about those in a minute. One of those ways is looking at things like the red blood cell level. So red blood cells are different from blood. What does that mean? So when we're looking at magnesium levels in something like a red blood cell, what we're actually asking is how much magnesium is in the cell itself? As in not how much is in the serum, but how much actually makes it across that, that cell membrane into this red blood cell. That's a much better marker of total body magnesium status than the serum level. It's like asking what's in this person's savings account versus their checking account. They may have a million dollars in their 401k or $200,000 of equity in their home or any other variety of other instruments of you know, uh, stores of wealth. But you know, if they've got $100,000 in their savings account, that's a very different story than if it's a thousand, you know, let alone if it's you know, something like a million, right? And why do I bring up this paper? This is one of the only papers that I know of anyway, where people were, were treated with magnesium based upon a red blood cell level. And they found really profound improvements in these patients' clinical status based upon repletion to this, or, or based upon this, this metric or, or uh, measurement of body magnesium levels. Now, the next lesson is that everything is connected, okay? So I already talked about how magnesium and calcium and potassium are connected. I talked about how you can't just assume that what's in the blood is what's in the tissues or in the cells or whatever. They're very different things. But mineral and vitamin levels, because they all work in the same pathways, will actually affect one another. So in this study, what they found is that after they gave B6 uh, to these uh, premenopausal women, the mean plasma and red blood cell magnesium levels were significantly elevated. So B6 helped these women improve their overall magnesium status, okay? Why is that important? It implies that if you have a deficiency of a, of a nutrient that's necessary for you to absorb and retain that nutrient, it doesn't matter how many, much of that nutrient you pour into the system unless that other nutrient's present. Vitamin D is another great example of this, right? We know that you can't lay down good bone 
architecture, we know that you can't absorb calcium from the gut without adequate vitamin D. Therefore, using a vitamin D supplement in a state of vitamin D deficiency is fruitless and may actually be dangerous if, for example, it gets into your blood and then winds up you know, depositing in a vascular wall. Another example of this is in uh, glutathione. So what they found in this study is that the levels of glutathione uh, correlate well with intracellular magnesium. And what this, they're, they're, they get into a lot of detail in this paper, but you know, at the end of the day, the bottom line here is that these nutrients all interact in order to determine what your basic health is and also your metabolism. And so there's many different ways that these things um, interact far more than I can get into in one single video, but it just, it comes back again and again and again, leaving a focus on a few minerals or a few vitamins or a few amino acids as being a rather myopic treatment of it, what must, I think, really be uh, considered holistically um, as, a, as a series of subsystems of a larger system. Next lesson, it is not just about what goes in your mouth. So people make the mistake of thinking that supplementation should be based upon uh, what they're eating, but there's way more to it than this, right? Uh, light is just one example of this. Now, everyone, and maybe not everyone, probably most people watching this video are aware of the linkages between vitamin D and sunlight, as in ultraviolet light from the sun, specifically of the B uh, um, variety or spectrum, triggers the synthesis of vitamin D in your skin. And you need that vitamin D to have healthy bones and to have overall good health and prevent autoimmune diseases and all this other stuff. Okay, all the things that vitamin D has been shown to do. All right. But the thing that people forget is that, you know, they're thinking about vitamin D as a nutrient and they supplement with it without thinking about what they're being exposed to as far as lighting in their environment. You don't need to take vitamin D supplements if you're getting adequate ultraviolet light. Now, what does adequate ultraviolet light mean? I'll make more videos on this, but the bottom line is that lots of people who have abundant sun exposure actually have vitamin D deficiency and would benefit from some degree of supplementation. Now, what that supplementation should be varies on a case-by-case -case basis in my practice, but you, you shouldn't just be thinking about what you're eating. Upshot of this paper is that they, the goal should be to maintain, in my clinical opinion anyway, maintaining blood concentrations of 25 hydroxy vitamin D above 80 nanomoles, nanomoles per liter, 30 nanograms per milliliter. This is important to maximize intestinal calcium absorption. It's also important for providing uh, the um, active form of vitamin D. And this is another thing that we got to talk about. So there's storage vitamin D and then there's active vitamin D. Many people with vitamin D deficiency based on 25 hydroxy vitamin D status actually have normal or even elevated active vitamin D activity. And people don't realize that you can put these people on huge doses of storage vitamin D and you may never correct that level. But when you look at their active vitamin D level, it is through the roof. I don't replete to levels that are through the roof on active vitamin D because we don't have any real data on it. And I'm not sure what it's doing to those patients. And I'm not going to pretend to. Although that being said, I know lots of people who pushed vitamin D levels to insanely high levels for long periods of time with no clear untoward effects. Um, it is possible to overdose. I have seen that uh, as well. The other thing I want people to realize is that, you know, although there's a chronic uh, increase in your risk of non-melanoma skin cancer with more sun exposure, uh, the direct sun exposure reduces your risk of all-cause mortality. That's based on the melanoma in Southern Sweden trial. Uh, and it's been really well established in the literature that actually avoiding the sun um, increases your risk of death, which if you're listening to health and wellness videos, you probably want to minimize. A less well-appreciated possible consequence of excessive sunlight exposure or sun exposure or even light exposure in general is effects on the B vitamin systems. So I just highlight folate in this example, but if you look at the B vitamins as a group of chemicals or, or nutrients, they're all, uh, they all have photonic properties. In other words, they have properties vis-a-vis -vis their interactions with light. Folate is well known to degrade when it is exposed to higher energies of light, um, blue, purple, ultraviolet. 
That's why in the hospital, when they hang folate as a drip, they'll put a brown paper bag over it. Same thing is why they put, you know, oils, cooking oils in dark green or dark brown bottles. Same thing with beer. They're trying to protect the chemicals inside of it from light that can degrade it and change the flavor or make it go bad. So with folate, there's this theory basically that we haven't really been able to well establish or, or, or substantiate, at least as far as I know, with real clinical data that the paler your skin, the more folate's gonna be degraded in your skin when you're exposed to really intense light. Uh, likewise, the darker your skin, the less folate degradation is gonna happen. And this would then explain the reasons for these very different skin tones that you see at different latitudes on planet Earth. So I'm not surprised to see folate deficiencies in patients who eat a folate deficient diet and who get an abundance of sun exposure. Um, particularly if they're pale skinned. So there's so much more nutrition that I think people are really being taught. And this is why, uh, you know, making assumptions about what your levels are is something that I, I, I no longer do because having tested, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of patients, I know better than to think I know what your vitamin or mineral levels are going to be coming through the door. Okay. And this is why you're not going to see me in affiliate relationships with um, vitamin or supplement manufacturers, uh, with very rare exceptions. Uh, I have yet to find a product that I really want to actually recommend to, uh, and sell to people. Um, if you want more information on my thoughts on this, you should subscribe to my, um, Substack blog. The paid version of that is where I post a lot of videos where I break down things like different products and I compare them. I talk about, you know, what the price point really should be or shouldn't be or whatever. And I talk about, you know, whether or not these things are really well formulated or if I would do them differently. And if I think really whether or not they're worth uh, the money that people are spending on them. In the meantime, all of the things that I am an affiliate for are things that are reusable and that will affect your nutritional status um, through their impact on your um, body systems, uh, let's call it bioenergetically. So I love the um, Spurdy vitamin D lamps. The sauna space is a great, you know, quick and simple home sauna. These are two great companies that make red and infrared lights that I recommend to my patients and that they use for everything from pain to um, fatigue. And then, you know, blue blockers from raw optics and blue blocks. Again, blue and higher energy lights at night will deplete levels of certain nutrients in the body. We know this. The, the clinical practice is just way behind the actual um, biophysics on this. Uh, and then iris for modulating screen temperature and then EMF mitigation, I think is, is gonna be the next thing that we really find. Uh, it is the thing I find valuable in my practice that not a lot of other doctors are, are interested in. And we know very clearly from the literature on melatonin and, and electromagnetic frequencies that excessive exposure to electromagnetic radiation uh, will negatively impact uh, melatonin levels, which of course is associated with a host of different um, uh, health consequences. So any affiliate purchases through my website, uh, the proceeds don't go towards me. They go towards the care of um, either people who have been injured uh, by pharmaceutical products um, or first responders who have been injured in the line of duty. So you can feel good about your affiliate subscriptions. On that note, I do have money in the bank for these people. If you know someone who's been injured by a pharmaceutical, uh, who's a first responder, who would like to get started with me um, using functional medicine to help deal with their medical issues, tell them to apply via my website and mention that you referred them and that they are aware um, of this opportunity to work with me um, on a charity basis. So as always, uh, thank you for watching. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. If this video has been helpful to you, make sure that you check out my link tree below to find out how you can keep in touch with me best. And if you would like to become a patient at my practice, please apply to work with me at stillmanmd.com. Thank you again for watching. Have a great day.